Procognito, Get Agile Podcast. Agile Engineering Practices. Interview with Ron Jeffries and Chad Hendrickson. So, welcome to Get Agile Podcast. And today with me is Ron Jeffries and Chad Hendrickson. Welcome. And uh, well, we have agreed that you will be uh, you will be uh, uh, introduced as people who noisy guys who make uh, extreme pro- uh, programming famous. So I'm gonna do that right now. And uh, so uh, let's start with the let's start with the XP. Let's start with the extreme programming. Uh, so the biggest difference, the, the biggest benefit we have in extreme programming is uh, engineering practice, other engineering practices. How do you see them right now after 25 years of XP being on the market? I, I don't, it's hard, that's really kind of a hard thing to say. I think there are people who are trying to do extreme programming out there but as far as I know, there's really no one who is uh, selling it, if you will, in the way that, that Scrum or Safe or Less or any of those things are being sold. So that to the extent that XP is adopted, it's really kind of probably being adopted at the root, you know, the grassroots level of people who hear about the ideas and, and start, start uh, using them. I- I'm going to have a slight disagreement with that because I think one of the things that that makes me think we had an impact, and by we I mean the beginning folks at the at the heart of where XP started, uh, is that when you go out and look at almost any tool set today, uh, you now see support for doing things that didn't exist 25 years ago. there's no no language out there uh, that does not have fairly robust testing tools, either integral into it or or built pretty close to the core of the of the of the language. Uh, pretty much any any tool that a serious programmer would be using today has built into it tools for testing and tools for refactoring uh, that just didn't exist 25 years ago. And and whether those things are being used or not, I, I you know, I blame Ron for. Uh, but the fact that they're there and that that they're available for people to use uh, in a way that things were not available 20 years ago, I think I think is an indication that that some of the ideas caught on in places that that potentially can make a difference. I, mean, well, I think I uh, totally uh, agree that the tools are there and that. Uh, and that there's a, a general appreciation for testing and test-driven development and so on. I think that a lot of the ideas are there uh, kind of from two angles. You, you know, it's not clear quite why the technology got created that way, and I think that is probably mostly due to the early XP momentum um, that caused compiler writers and IDE writers to to see that those tools were, were going to be useful. To the extent that anything is being actually used today, um, I, I see two threads of, of possible that that could come about. One is what I was talking about, the grassroots effort of people who just read about these things, read my website, read Chet's articles, go to our courses, do things, who, who have picked this up at the grassroots level because they have learned it makes their work easier. And there is a thread of ideas that have that are now coming uh, primarily, I think, from people who are trying to do Scrum. And Scrum now has stories that you say it's as if it's as if stories were really in there. Um, now, the Scrum community has not done a great job of pushing for technical practice. But what they have done is they have created scrum teams which need technical practice. And there's really only one place to look for that. But my point was not that the people aren't finding it, but that the people are finding it more on their own and less because of any kind of a marketing thrust, because there is no marketing thrust for XP. 
So um, I think I know the answer, the, the answer, but I'm going to ask this anyway. Why is that? Why why we get so much traction into Scrum? Why we don't have enough traction into uh, engineering practices? I think I think there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one is 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 that there is this marketing push behind Scrum. This the, you know the, uh, uh, Ken and Jeff came up with training that had a brilliant marketing strategy where you call something certified <clears throat> and therefore destroys the market for anything that isn't certified. Uh, and I think, that, I think that makes a big difference that that pushed into that. Um, the other thing is, is that, that again, uh, you come in and you start doing scrum, you have these new roles, uh, Scrum Master, which no, no, no company not doing Scrum has anybody called a Scrum Master. Uh, you have a product owner, same thing is true. And the rest are developers. Well, you know, I don't have a Scrum Master, so I've got a training. I don't have a product owner, so I've got a trainer. I've got developers, and obviously I hired the best developers available in the world because that's what I tell everybody. Uh, and I, I hired certainly the best developers in the world who would work for me for the for the amount of money I was willing to pay them, uh, and therefore it would be a a bad reflection upon me if I now have to train these people to do the job I hired them for, and therefore I'm not going to do that because that would be a bad reflection on me, and so maybe what we should have done is change the name of developer in Scrum to something else. Uh, that cause people to need to train them. That's I think I think that has an impact on it. Uh, what do you think about that, Ron? And I I think that that in addition to that, another force that acts exactly on that on that same vector is the fact that it's very expensive to train developers because you only have one scrum master per team, one product owner per team, maybe even less than one, um, and you have five, three, six, seven, nine developers. And so even if training costs the same per person, it would be five, six, seven, nine times more to train your developers. And in fact, it takes longer to train a developer to do Scrum than it does to train a Scrum Master to the point that they can get a certification because development is actually hard. Um, and it's actually, the, the difference between development being hard and product ownering being hard, it is really very hard to be a good product owner, to know what you should do and what you shouldn't do and to do that stuff. But there is no immediate feedback or measure. Whereas if you're not a good Scrum developer, at the end of the sprint, you don't have any software. And it becomes very obvious that, that it's not working. And uh, that's why it takes more training because there's, there's just more to really get settled. So I think that the economics of training developers has also played in on that same thread that we we hired them to be good and so therefore we have to say that they're good. But in addition, if we did want to train them, we'd have to take weeks out of the schedule to do that and many, many dollars. Now I believe that that says for us, looking to, the, to what I like to think of as the future, I think that that says that we need to continue to find low cost ways to directly address developers as to how they should do this. Um, and there are people doing that. Jim Shore, Joe Rainsberger have, have very nice packages of training for JavaScript and various other areas. Um, there's, there's other stuff out there that is affordable. Um, and that at least means that there is a way for developers to get trained. What has not yet been cracked is to create the demand, to really get everybody to understand that they really ought to be doing this, they ought to be looking there. Um, and for that, I had hoped to be able to look to the Scrum Alliance to get behind uh, uh, this topic, and uh, their priorities seem to be otherwise. I think, and I think, also, yeah, I think yeah, the, so, the feedback loop, the feedback loop on quality is, is such that it's can be longer appearing. Uh, uh, it isn't really, but it can appear to be longer, uh, if, if particularly if, you're if you have an organization that has trained itself over the years to not pay particular attention to, to the quality of the work being done. 
uh, you may you may be astounded at this, but but I actually go places, go visit companies where they have so many defects, they have to have a tool to keep track of them, and it must be soul cr crushing uh, to work in an environment where quality and, and interest in quality is so low that that the organization not only allows that to happen but sort of expects that to be normal. They 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 have deadened their senses to the quality of the products they're building, and therefore they don't notice that they're two steps above crap at best. Um, and there is another angle onto this one, and uh, the concept that the developer should already know the engineering part, and the only thing that they need to learn is uh, tools. I don't know how you feel about this one. So like, a, we give them tools, but they should already know how to do the coding stuff. Yeah, that's, that's, I, think, I think that is a, a very common idea, but you have to look around and say, well, how is it that they would have acquired this knowledge? Does the tooth fairy come and whisper it in their ears while they're sleeping at night? Uh, was there a class they should have taken at programmer school uh, and they didn't take it? Uh, but, you know, you find very few academic programs that are teaching people how to develop software properly. Uh, you see an awful lot of organizations, a lot of universities that are teaching programmers, teaching people in, the, in computer engineering that, that where this, the students walk out with their diploma uh, and actually not know how to do any programming whatsoever or at any real level. Uh, and also there's this is what you said is like uh, we hire people, the best people we had on the market, so they should know how to program already, right? And as a CIO, I have no idea how to test if they can program or not, right? Right, you wouldn't have been a CIO if you could program. Right. Now I do. Th <laughs> now I think that I think that in in sort of in semi fairness. The fact is that the way you need to program if you're going to work in a short cycle, iterative, incremental way is different from the way people are often trained to program, those who are actually trained at all. Uh, because the, the style of that training, and that, that teaching is still very much, you, you figure out your requirements and then you figure out your design and then you implement your design and then you test it. And we don't really do waterfall, but the thinking is still there. that. That if the you know you got to get the requirements right, you got to get the design right, and that is a way of programming which may or may not work, but it simply will not work in a situation where in two weeks you've got to have running software, and so you need to learn how to build a little tiny program, and then grow it and grow it, and have it not turn into this horrible net of of junk. You have to keep it clean and keep it growing in a in a healthy way. And that is not something that, uh, as Chet says, it's not taught in universities. Most of the coding dojos, most of the learn how to code things on, on the internet, the beginner coding things, don't teach it. Um, if you look at any, any language training, whatever language you want to you look at, you will not see these ideas in that training. Um, you want to learn, whether you want to learn JavaScript or Ruby or Kotlin, you won't find incremental development even talked about. So it's a, it is a really odd gap in that there's things you have to know, things you have to learn how to do, techniques, and uh, they are not, they don't come to you the way learning the syntax would come to you or the way finding a library would come to you. The, those techniques are, are, are just not, not accessible uh, they don't, they don't flash in front of your eyes. They're out there. You could read my website. You could do a lot of stuff. But they don't come into your face the way it does when you, you know, link to Amazon and find out what Amazon Web Services is. I uh, went out a year or so ago and looked up the most popular Java book uh, used at universities in the United States. And I don't remember what it was called, but I found the one that was the the one that had the largest share, and and looked through its index, looked through its uh, a table of contents, and, and and glanced to see where things were being taught. 
uh, they, the first half of the book is teaching you how to essentially code the way I was taught when I was taught COBOL in, in, in the early 1980s, uh, t very procedural. Uh, but not actually teaching you how to write good procedural code, just teaching you how to, you know, I'm surprised they didn't in inject some way of doing go-tos. Uh, and only in the second half of the book are any basic object ideas brought in. Uh, and nowhere in there is really anything about how one goes about testing any of this. And so even in the most mature of the languages currently being used, uh, uh, Java, uh, you don't see even in the book the college students are being uh, uh, you are using when they learn things the basic ideas you need to have in order to write it well and certainly no ideas about how you go about testing it and 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 so one of the things perhaps industry needs to be doing is going to universities and technical schools and demanding they start doing a better job uh, certainly here in the United States uh, we are on the cusp of of a crash I believe because the systems here that are running the most basic services, both commercial and, business, and government, are 40, 50 years old, written in languages uh, that maybe only Ron and I remember how to work in. And the chances of getting us to come out and help you is pretty slim. Uh, and I think we're in trouble. Uh, we're, you know, we see here in the, in the COVID issues going on where we're trying to improve uh, uh, the unemployment benefits in the United States across the 50 states that where, where those things are happening, you see people uh, in, in those states calling out for help to update these old COBOL programs because they don't have anybody around who can actually keep the stuff that's being used today running. Uh, we're, and we're building more and more of that kind of, of, of immediately obsolete ideas. It's, it's, a, it's worrying to me. I'm glad I'm old and I'm, you know, but I'm, but my bank is probably running Bulgarian assembler or something weird, so. Yeah, a friend of mine called uh, one piece of code uh, like uh, it was Legacy at the moment we wrote it. So I think this is what you mentioned. Uh, still, most of the organization they say we do agile development and uh, we do incremental development and they try to do so. So how do they succeed right now? Do they? I believe that most organizations that do something like Scrum probably see some improvement just because they try to build software every couple of weeks. But I would say that they only see a fraction of what they could see if they were to do it right. Um, so what I believe is that is that Scrum in particular, because it is the main brand of Agile, has great breadth of coverage. There's probably no big company that doesn't think they've got Scrum in it, but it has very little depth. And um, it's challenging. I, you know, I, I speak of it as a marketing problem, um, a sales problem, because the people who are talking to the companies about either about having Scrum or about having Safe or having whatever, or using Jira or whatever tool they're selling. Those people are all telling the story that all you got to do is you got to do this and then everything is going to be super fine. And while those products have their value, everything's not going to be super fine if you don't actually execute these ideas, if you don't begin to take them into your spirit and do the stuff that you have to do in order to make the stuff work. It is not just easy. It isn't twice the work in half the time, just because the book says it's twice the work in half the time. Uh, it, it requires actual concentration, dedication, and learning. And people, particularly here, I don't know, you know about Europe, but people here really want the quick fix for everything. Yeah, install Jira and you're done, right? We, we do. We have Jira. We have a, a a fifteen minute phone call every day, and now we're agile. Uh, and and all these ideas are predicated on change. Uh, certainly, Scrum says that our our job is to show you what you're doing poorly, and so that you can then figure out how to improve that. 
uh, uh, the general ideas of Kanban are that same sort of thing. The ideas of Lean are that sort of thing to show you where there are problems so you can do something about it. And what we have mostly is what I like to call uh, all chart and no change. Uh, we draw all kinds of pictures. We draw all kinds of pictures, but we don't actually do anything about them. And you see that all the way down through the organization. I mean, how, how many places do you see where they actually have meaningful retrospectives at the end of every sprint, where they come out with an actual thing they're going to do differently starting next time around? Uh, most, most teams have the same retrospective every two weeks where they sit around for an hour and complain about things, and then they... They're done, and they come back and complain about the exact same things next time, and this retrospective thing doesn't help us. Uh, if you don't pay attention to the feedback, then there's no point in using the, uh, taking the time to create the feedback. So. And to add to this one, I think one of the, one of the challenges we have is like a, uh, the Scrum Master are not pushing uh, or promoting name it more correctly, uh, on the engineering practices. I just asked a super simple question last week on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, how many, uh, in, in, so asking developers and, and, and QA and, and, and people in the teams, Scrum teams doing software, uh, did your uh, Scrum master uh, see your code? And like 60% of people say, no, never. So, so basically it's the Scrum master I have no contact with the code in the in the software development, right? Well, so I'm, I not, guess, I guess, I'm on, not sure on. whether a Scrum master necessarily needs to have contact with the code, but I am sure that what is taught to a Scrum master is has only a very thin mention of. By the way, technical practices are important. Most of them are not programmers; they're analysts or or other kind of business people. They don't know what technical practices really are. They're told at some, in one little session in their Scrum Master training, technical practices are important, and they're, they're not equipped, and they're not supposed to be equipped, really. Uh, they're not equipped to say what technical practices are or how to use them. That, that is, in my view, not, by intention, by design, that is not the Scrum Master's job because Scrum, by design, does not have technical practices. They consciously chose, at the time they created Scrum, not to include technical practices because it would make it too hard. And the, everybody nods to technical practices when you, when you in the Scrum training, and a few of us really try pretty hard to bring out why they're there and what, the, what they might be. But by and large, they are not, technical practices are not a concern in the Scrum community. Well, I would say as a Scrum Master, if I if I am supposed to help the team, then if I don't know, you know, how do they do the product? How can I help them doing that? I would, and you that. would, but that, but in general, that that is not what goes on. Uh, I I would say, by the way, that a, that a Scrum Master with their two days of training um, is ill-equipped to to do very much helping at any level. They don't really know how the product owner should do their job either. They don't know how anything should be done because they're, they're, they're supposed to get in that two days of training. They're supposed to be enlightened. They're supposed to, to realize, wow, this is important and there's a lot to it. I really got to dig in. And they're, they, the hope is that they will then you know, tear through the, the terrain figuring out all this stuff. Well, the fact is they get sent back to their office and they get told to whip those devs into shape and get some software out and they uh, how much time they have to put in on on that kind of uh, self-training is is open to question uh, the last i knew um the scrum alliance has a has a thing called the certified scrum practitioner i guess after the uh that comes after certified scrum master and the last i knew less than one tenth of the certified scrum masters uh, ever attained the certified scrum practitioner label. I don't know whether that's still true or not, but it's a fraction in any case of the folks who uh, who need that, who actually wind up getting it. 
I don't know about this one. But what I what I observe is that the Scrum Master usually is the person who has enough time to read something in the organization. So I'm not sure it's so bad. At least from my experience, again, you know, working with different components, seeing different different patterns in this case. Uh, so let me just check: is this one the something you call dark Scrum, or there is a difference between what we are talking about and the dark Scrum you mentioned? Well. Uh, I, I coined the phrase dark scrum when I was thinking about how scrum can go really bad. Um, we see teams who maybe they have a trained scrum master, maybe they don't. They probably don't have a trained product owner. And then they're just put under incredible pressure to develop software and given no training, no resources, no anything. Now, it used to be that when you were a programmer, they would say, how long will it take to write this program? And you would say six months, and then six months would go by, and they would say, are you done yet? And you'd say, no, it's probably only about another three months. And they would go away for three months, and they would come back, and, you know, and so on. So you very rarely came under serious pressure. But with Scrum, you come under serious pressure every two weeks or every week. Or every day. Or every day, if, you know, if they really started trying to do it right, except they won't. Um, and the result of that is that, that Scrum can make developers' lives worse instead of better. And that, it's when that starts happening that, that, that uh, I think of it as dark scrum. And that's most, you know, there are plenty of other ways scrum can go wrong and plenty of other reasons why you might want to say bad things about a particular scrum situation. But to me, with, my heart is with developers, and so I care that the developers are suffering, and that's kind of where I picked that name to go. I, I think, you know, that the, the, one of the main ways that you see dark scrum happening is, is in the daily scrum. Uh, as, as Ron just, just described, that in the old days, you'd get something to do and you would work on it forever how long it took to get it done. And you might, you might have to give an update uh, once a week or so uh, uh, to your team leader or your project manager, whoever that is. But now we have this wonderful thing called Scrum. And every day at 9.30, I have to stand up and say what it was I did yesterday and what am I going to do today. Uh, and that changes the, how the world works. Uh, and so much so that even Ken and Jeff have, have pushed back and they're they're beginning to to de-emphasize those, the so-called three questions, because the point of the daily scrum is not to answer those questions, but to do the thing that comes after that, which is what are we going to do? How are we going to get one day closer to our goal? Uh, not, you know, how did I spend the, what, what tickets did I work on yesterday? And what tickets am I going to work on today? It's, it's, we have, we're a team, which means we have a common goal that we're working together to achieve. And the daily scrum is a place where you're supposed to spend a few minutes figuring out how we're going to get one day closer to having that goal accomplished. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe that this, you know, that the scrum master is there only if the development team wants them. I think, I think most development teams should do should not even invite the, the scrum master to their daily scrum, uh, because they probably are more of a hindrance to communication than they are a, a catalyst for it. They're probably there to, to fill out things in JIRA instead of making getting the team working together as if they were actually a team, as opposed to just a collection of random people who are siloed against some problem. So. Yeah, and we end up as with the Scrum Master doing like a, you know, team assistant job, like a secretary to the team. And so... I, I've never worked on anything that I can recall where we needed to know exactly the status every day uh, because you spend more time trying to figure out the status than you are improving the status. Uh, only in special circumstances is that kind of m m management required. Yeah, it'd have to be something like the life or death or the whole data centers down or something horrible before you yeah. really needed minute by minute status. You know, if you're, if you're trying to land a a, a spacecraft, you probably need really close updates, but even then, you really want to leave it in the hands of the people that are sending out the data. You can't be submitting all your ideas up to Elon every time you try and land the thing. 
You know, yeah, but there are times, you know, when when somebody's off in the weeds, and somebody, and the way you discover that is they have made they've made no visible progress for a day or two, and you just kind of start trying to help them understand that they're not solving the problem anymore. They're just who knows what they're doing. Uh, but it's it's a it's a you go off and you explain those ideas to folks, and it's amazing how often when you kind of walk through how how this thing dark scrum is implemented that folks confess and say, yeah, that's what we do it. That's what we do. And it's like, yes, let's stop that. And it's, it's an interesting thing to have people self recognize that what we're doing is this dark scrum and not really what we're supposed to be doing. And that, that's a kind of an interesting conversation to have. So I'm going to ask you one more, uh, maybe a bit challenging question. Um, if I'm a CEO of the company and we just get into this COVID situation, how do I know that we have a uh, engineering practices on the, right level so people know how to do how to do coding how do i recognize that we're doing it well you look at the product every two weeks and see whether it is improving see whether you're getting the features you want uh, see whether it works or fails to work because if you're doing scrum agile or xp correctly you have real live working software all the time that improves visibly all the time there's no other way to do that than to use the XP practices as far as we know. If there is another way, it doesn't matter. Because as long as you can deliver improving software every two weeks, if you've got elves working in there down there doing it, it's fine with us. It's the result that counts. You know, one of the questions that came up, you know, often 20 years ago was, was from folks saying, well, how, how do I get my development teams uh, uh, to do uh, test-driven development? Uh, and the answer is always you don't. You don't care. You shouldn't care about that in the same sort of way that the CEO shouldn't care where the curly braces are. Uh, but what you'd want is a continuous stream of increasingly improving product flowing out of your teams. Uh, and the only way you can do that, as Ron said, is to do, those, do these practices because otherwise uh, you're going to spend – more and more time remediating defects, more and more time remediating poor design decisions, uh, as opposed to working gracefully across the problem, they're, they're hacking at it. And that shows up to the outside world. The, you know, the, the only KPIs that matter are the ones your customers own, the ones your customers see. Uh, you know, can I, can I deliver a new version of my product to my customers in a, just a, in a continuous flow so that there's never an update. It's just every day it's better, it, you know, and, and that's what you want. That's what you want is the product just continually having better features, newer features, uh, working better. And you never think about how you got there. If you're doing it well, you don't have to think about those things. They just happen the right way. Uh, how you get from there to where we are now to there, requires a change in mindset, requires a change in, in, in how we approach our problems. And the rest of it flows, I think, from that. So we might see a short, uh, you know, all, all, hand, all hands on deck, but in the long run, without the engineering practices, that's going to be basically, you know, huge depth from, from, the, from the, not the technical part, but from the, from the quality part as well. Well, you know, if you, if you look at the standard mm, tools, that, that scrum teams are supposed to be emitting to the world, uh, things like burn charts and such, uh, you can look at a burn chart if you know what you're looking for and know whether the technical practices are, are in place because if they're not building testing in from the beginning, uh, you know, you're gonna go along and all of a sudden you're gonna have to, you're gonna stop building product to fix these defects. Uh, and that shows up. Uh, if they have to stop and and refactor the system because they worked for five sprints and now we're going to take a sprint off to improve the design, they're flat, they're, your burn chart goes flat, and so and so you you can just see it from across the room in the standard tools that that, that Scrum teams have, uh, assuming they're telling us the truth and they they ought to you know, uh, and and so the, our job is to work in such a way that our product owner can make rational decisions about what to do. I, I, my background 
uh, it was in economics. That's what I studied in university years ago when I discovered I enjoyed the programming better than the, the cross partial derivatives. And so I became a, a software developer instead of an economist. Uh, but I know all these things and I know, I know that, that, that if, if we are building poor quality, it, quality has to be fixed one way or another. And, and in, in economics, this is called an externality, where, where somebody gets a benefit and somebody else has to pay part of the cost of it. And, and if you think about a rational market uh, for features that the product owner gets to buy, it should not matter when the product owner asks for a particular feature, it should cost the same. Whether it's the first thing they do or the last thing they do, it should cost the same. And if we're poor, building poor quality, Things that come later have to subsidize the stuff that came before it to improve the quality so you can build the new thing. And therefore, it, it, it perverts the product owner's vision of what they should be asking for. So they're not able to make the right decisions about what to build into the product. Uh, and that's bad. That's bad. You want the product owner to be able to ask for anything they want, and it should cost the same whether they do it on day one or they last. Okay, I want to finish with one more question. And as Procognita, we have a 10 years anniversary. Uh, and I would like to ask you about how do you see the, the change over the, the last decade? So, so we move into the cloud, we move into the you know, so hardware, hardware as a software idea. Uh, so how do you see the, in those engineering practices applying now with all these uh, changes? We, it's, you know, it's easier to ship, ship software. You don't need to ship the floppy disk. How do you see this one happening? We were actually talking about this just, uh, just late last week. Um, there is a, a way of developing software that's becoming more and more prevalent now uh, with uh, packages, Docker, Kubernetes, with use of things like Amazon Web Services and other, other cloud type services, uh, microprocesses kinds of things um, that we believe, I suspect, and I think Chet mostly agrees, are a, possibly a little different from the kind of programming we're used to doing, where you wrote some Java that actually did something. Um, and so there's getting to be more and more of programming that is trying to be just like assembling pieces, putting these pieces together, and we write a little glue code, and then, wow, we have, a, we have an application. Um, I'm not good enough at those techniques to, to have a, a solid way of saying whether whether the same tools work, whether it's going to take new tools. Um, I would certainly be doing the same thing. I would be trying to produce working software every day um, that was more and more in the direction of, of what we wanted to be. But whether or not exactly the same practices as we use in XP apply, uh, I suspect sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I, I, I almost 100% uh, agree with that. Uh, the one thing I will say is that in my career, going back to the days of punching cards uh, to do COBOL and PL1 on mainframes, there are some basic ideas uh, that have been true since I was probably in the sixth grade uh, that are still true today. The ideas of of uh, cohesion and and coupling and modularity uh, those things are still true I think I would be very very surprised if any of those technical changes technical evolutions or whatever they are has changed those basic ideas that you want all the stuff that gets works together to do a thing to be in one place uh, you want uh, to be able to use that without having to know how it works on the inside so somebody can change it on the inside without you having to react to that. Uh, I think we're in, a, we're, we're in a, a, a time of flux, although software development has almost always been in times of flux. Uh, but today I think we're in a particular time when, when the tools it takes to do something fairly mundane uh, is quite high. 
that we're kind of at a point of immaturity based on the technologies we have right now. And I think over the next few years, those hopefully those technologies will mature enough that we can get back to the real business. You know, right now we're doing all this stuff here in the U.S. at least, and I imagine in Europe it is mostly true. It is for the extent that I know what's going on over there, of of converting to uh, a digital transformation, uh, uh, which mostly means putting stuff on a website someplace that somebody can interact with. Uh, to a large extent, they're doing the same kinds of things we were doing in CICS 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but it takes a whole lot more moving parts because it turns out that environment was pretty mature. Uh, this environment today is not that mature. And so you could do, you could do those things much, much easier than you can now. It, it took, you know, three or four different, th different pieces to work together to do that. Today, it takes many, many pieces in order to get that to work. But I think those things will work themselves out and we'll, we'll have a fairly standard way of doing that stuff, uh, hopefully not in the not too distant future. Uh, and then we can get back to actually solving interesting problems. Right now, I think maybe the only interesting problems that are being solved are, are uh, building games that have intense behavior in them. But a lot of stuff is being built today is just pulling stuff off and putting it someplace else. I, I saw a, a, a team at a very large automobile company in Michigan uh, last year that was uh, building a system uh, that could have been done better, cheaper, faster uh, with a spreadsheet. Uh, and they had some weird reason why they couldn't use a spreadsheet. Uh, and so they're going to spend untold hours of, of developer time uh, instead of just using a, a, a Google Doc spreadsheet. If all you're doing is replacing a Google Doc spreadsheet, you're probably not solving any problem that's going to make your company better. Yeah, there there are no problems that couldn't be solved in Excel mostly, right? <laughs> All right, thank you guys very much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it, and you know I hope we finally be able to see each other in real life, not in just on the on the online tools. Thank you very much once again. To learn more, visit procognita.com/getagile.